ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونستغفره ونتوب اليه ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن سيدنا محمدا عبده ورسوله يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون يا أيها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحدة وخلق من وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والارحام ان الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم اعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما أما بعد فإن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها فكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار الحمد لله الحمد لله الذي أنزل على عبده الكتاب ولم يجعل له عوجا الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا ان هدانا الله الحمد لله رب العالمين all praises due to allah the lord of all the worlds all praises due to allah who has guided us to this path and we would not have been able to guide ourselves and not allah guided us All praises due to Allah who has revealed the scripture unto his slave servant and has made no crookedness therein. <coughs> Alhamdulillah we are winding down the season of the Hajj. Many of the Hajjaj have returned. Most, if not all, have returned from the sacred precincts. And as the month winds down and the Hajj season comes to an end and we enter the new year ushered in by the first of Muharram we do well to reflect on the character, the figure who really is at the center of the rituals of the Hajj and that figure is our great spiritual patriarch Ibrahim alayhi salam or Abraham peace be upon him Ibrahim alayhi salam, Abraham, is described in the Qur'an many different places. Each one sheds a unique light or perspective on an aspect of his character, his religious and spiritual significance. Peace be upon him. So we'll begin reflecting on just a few points related to Abraham, peace upon him, based on what Allah Ta'ala mentions in the Qur'an. So Allah Ta'ala describes Abraham, Ibrahim alayhi salam, إِنَّ إِبْرَهِيمَ كَانَ أُمَّةً قَانِتًا لِلَّهِ حَلِيثًا وَلَمْ يَكُمْ مِنَ الْمُشْرِكِينَ شَاكِرًا لِأَنْعُمِي اجتباهوا وهداهوا إلى سراط مستقيم that verily Abraham was now we'll just say an ummah just a literal repetition of the Arabic phrase verily Abraham was an ummah and the Ibrahim كان أمة قانتة لله was devoutly deeply obedient to Allah حنيفا He was naturally inclined towards monotheism. So the innate nature that was, we've all been created with the propensity to recognize the oneness of God, this 
inequality was extremely strong in Ibrahim <laughs> He was not amongst the idolaters. Shakiran <laughs> and Umi. He was deeply appreciative and grateful for the gifts of his Lord. Ishtabahu. He was chosen, or he chose him. God, Allah Ta'ala, chose him. Wahadahu. And guided him to a straight path. So, time does not allow for us to examine these two verses fully. So, we'll mention two things. First, the Ummah. And the Ibrahim Akana Ummatan. He was an Ummah. This means several things. We'll emphasize two of the meanings here. One is a leader. So, Ummah, Alif Mim Mim is the same root, is from the same root, derived from the same root as Imam. Alif, Mim, Mim, Imamun. Um, Alif, Mim, Mim. A leader, Ibrahim was a leader. And the Ibrahim again an Ummah. He was a leader, and as our exemplar, we should all strive to be leaders. Far too many Muslims are content with being followers. And it would be one thing if many of us were following the best of what other traditions, other ways had to offer. But oftentimes we follow the worst. We follow consumerism, materialism, nationalism. Many of these isms that are tearing our word of, world apart, we follow right along. A leader sets a sterling example. A leader sets an inspiring example that inspires others to follow them. So people who are inspired to follow Ibrahim's example of monotheism. And as a result, the great fakes, the monotheistic fakes of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam are all inspired at their root by Abraham, alayhi salam, peace be upon him. It takes courage to be a leader. It takes courage. Far too many people just go along to get along. Just follow the leader. Someone else's lead. If they dress this way, the Muslims dress that way. If they wear their pants falling off their rear end, you'll find a lot of Muslims running around with their pants falling off their rear end. If they have a baseball cap designed to shade your eyes, but they turn it backwards and they're squinting because the sun's in their eyes, you find a lot of Muslims with baseball caps turned around backwards squinting because the sun is in their eyes. If they throw spandex on the women so they're naked without being naked, you find a lot of Muslim women running around in spandex, trying to halalify it some kind of way. Just going along to get along. If they throw up these characters running around in skinny jeans, you find Muslim men, a fair number running around in skinny jeans can't even do salat properly. And but got to go along to get along. Now, Ibrahim was a leader and we should endeavor to be leaders. And one of the principal qualities that is required for leadership is courage. Shaja is courage. Ibrahim was courageous. And if you Look at the descriptions of Ibrahim السلام, and other courageous individuals in the Qur'an. You see, oftentimes their courage is a function of their youthfulness. Because youth don't have anything to lose. So a lot of times the youth will take a courageous stand because they're not worried about how the, who's going to pay the rent? Or how I'm going to pay the car? Or what about my future? I might get on somebody's list. Now, youth, oftentimes, because they haven't lived 
long in the world, and therefore they have been become deeply entangled in the world. They are very easy to display courage in situations that someone who's much older will hesitate and be hesitant. So this youthful courage, we have a tradition that's called the tradition of futuwa. So the, the courageous young person who is self-sacrificing, who is willing to sacrifice for others, who is willing to jeopardize their own personal interests for the sake of others. So Ibrahim is described as a feta, as a, as a courageous young man. So when the people came and they found their idols had been smashed, So they saw them, so who's done this to our, our idols? Verily, this is an oppressive, wrongdoing person. They said, we heard a young man. He's known as Abraham. So he had the courage to smash the idols. And smashing idols is a courageous endeavor. Because a lot of times, people have a lot of things invested in their idols. We know the idols of the Quraysh, there was a lot of business invested in that. There was a lot of tourism, to use a modern term, that was invested in that. There was a lot of revenue that was invested in those idols. There was personal security that was invested in those idols. There was a feeling, a sense of stability that this is the tradition of our forefathers. They worshiped these idols. And by assuming and taking on that worship ourselves, there is a sense of continuity and a sense of stability. It takes courage to go against that. We have to have that courage, brothers and sisters. The idols before us nowadays, particularly in this country, they're not the idols Idols of wood and stone, like the people, the Quraysh and other Arabian tribes were worshiping. worshiping. There's the idol of the self, which is, is brilliantly, or, or we should say is fittingly, captured in this era of the selfie. Myself, oh, I make sure I look good enough for this picture that I take myself, selfie, selfie. Nafsi, nafsi, the worship of the self. And Allah Ta'ala warns us, Have you not seen the one that takes his very inclination as his God? Whatever the whims of his soul suggest, he's ready to follow that. It takes courage to challenge that, because in challenging it, it can it challenge our entire identity, our entire sense of self. And a lot of people don't have that courage because they might end up in no man's land or in no woman's land without the normal supports they become accustomed to. But that position of insecurity is the first step in conquering ourselves. As our scholars with Mukhalafa to Hawat Ainu Dawa'i. Opposing the inclinations of your soul is the very essence of your cure. It is the very essence of the cure. Because the nafs wants us to stay in the comfort zone. To stay in that comfort zone. To be, to, to, it enjoys that warm and fuzzy feeling. And when it's challenged and when it's made uncomfortable, that's when we begin to overcome it. The nafs of the idols of our day are racism. And look how persistent this idol is <coughs> in our society. If anyone looking at the events of today, and it's not just a one-sided affair, just white racism. There's racism on all sides. You find people from many different sides. There's racism in the Muslim community. That's an idol that we have to have the courage to smash. 
And we have to have the courage because in doing that, we might go against the prejudices accepted, acknowledged, or unaccepted, or unacknowledged of our parents, of our relatives, our friends, our neighbors, our co-workers. But this is an idol that has to be smashed if this country is going to fulfill its full potential. America will never feel live up to its full potential until the idol of racism is smashed. Never. And it's a consistent, enduring problem that we should be, as Muslims, endeavoring to shine a new light on. It. And although the very fact that we have many different races and ethnicities in this congregation doesn't indicate that those races and ethnicities are always coexisting in a harmonious fashion, the fact, though, that many can look beyond race as Malcolm X noted when he was, went to his Hajj, and Malcolm was not a stupid person, <clears throat> to see how Islam had that power. As Arnold Toynbee noted in his discussion of Islam and Western civilization, two things Islam can offer to the Western world. A, a, a solution to the race problem and to the problem of intoxicants. Look at our country, we're, we're being inundated with alcohol, inundated with opiates. We're the market for cocaine. We drive all those murders in Mexico. They're killing each other to see who will control, who will have access to the American market of illicit drugs, of cocaine and marijuana. That's the driving factor between those 100,000 deaths in Mexico. But what percentage of Muslims there are Muslims that drink, and, but what percentage? It's a small percentage that have a drug problem, an alcohol problem. That's the power of Islam, and that's the power we can offer to our fellow citizens. But we have to have the courage, first of all, to believe that it works. Secondly, to implement it within ourselves. And not be like the person the poet pointed out, that tenhan khudukin wa tatiya mithlahum. Don't condemn a characteristic and then you engage it and embody it yourself. It's a tremendous shame upon you were you to do so. And we can go on, but you get the idea. We have to be courageous people, brothers and sisters. The coming period in the history of this country is not a period that will be kind to cowards. It will not be kind to cowards. And a person might think they can live through their cowardice, but as they say, a courageous person dies one death, <coughs> and a coward dies 100 times every day. So it's choosing a dignified death, or it's choosing many undignified deaths in situation after situation after situation that calls for courage, Abrahamic courage, Mohammedan courage, we don't stand up. May Allah make it easy. May Allah give us tawfiq. May Allah give us taysir. In the Ibrahim Akana Ummah, another meaning of Ummah is a moral, a compository, a repository of moral qualities. In other words, Ibrahim or Abraham combined within himself qualities that would be epitomized amongst the various members of a nation or a community. So this sister is known for her truthfulness. This sister is so honest. This brother is so courageous. This sister is so faithful. This brother is so <coughs> trustworthy, etc. Those qualities that were uh, epitomized in different individuals were combined in Ibrahim to an exalted degree. <laughs> they were combined in him. And so again, we should strive to be a repository of lofty morals, lofty character, refined manners. We should strive. We should not try to get on the race to the bottom with everyone else. <laughs> There was a time in this country no one used foul language except people who are foul themselves. 
Four letter words as they said. Many of us who grew up in a bygone era in this country, we would say something and uh, we would get our mouths washed out with soap. We would get physically disciplined when that was still legal to do. And you couldn't get out of it. What did you say, boy? I said, gosh darn it. You didn't say, gosh darn it, I know what you said. My ears are working, get over here. And there was, and it wasn't Whole Foods designer soap. Like strawberry oatmeal. It was ivory. That's some nasty stuff. It was lye soap. That's, but that's, there was a time people dressed in a dignified fashion. There was a time if this master were a church, everyone in here would be wearing a suit. <coughs> everyone in here would be wearing a suit. There was a time when people held doors for the elderly. There was a time where people carried groceries out of the grocery store for someone not necessarily elderly. Maybe someone with a lot of children are trying to manage. Sure, I'll take your groceries, you car, miss. You, you take care of the children. Where people thought of each other. Now we have philosophies of life that are dominant, that encourage selfishness. And it permeates throughout our entire country. From the top to the bottom. People thought of others. People considered others before they thought about themselves. There was an altruistic spirit. Now we have the likes of Ayn Rand arguing and many people agreeing that altruism is a human weakness and a despicable characteristic. And you have people in the United States Congress who are saying we shouldn't be assisting poor people. Who are saying we shouldn't have any mercy for people who aren't necessarily born here but came here as children and therefore this is the only home they know. They don't know any other home. We shouldn't have any mercy for them. People are saying we shouldn't have any mercy for people overseas whose resources we might have taken because we consume a disproportionate share of the world's resources. People growing the bananas in the Banana Republic are suffering from potassium deficiency because the bananas in the Banana Republic are coming here year round so we can eat them. People growing tomatoes so we can have tomatoes in the middle of the winter on our tables aren't eating the tomatoes, they're picking them. And if they eat any of them, they'll be fired and won't even have access to the meager wages that allow them to buy some crop. We don't think about these things because we're, we've been conditioned to only think about ourselves. The quinoa craze, everyone, quinoa is healthy, wholesome food. We never think, this is not my, there's a, a major expose about five years ago in the New York Times, how the native people in the Andes who grow the quinoa, now it's in so much demand, they sell the quinoa, which was a staple of their diet, and gave them protein and everything they needed to get cash, and they take the cash and buy white rice, and now they're suffering from malnutrition. But we don't think about that because we're conditioned to think about ourselves and serving ourselves and having the whole world serve us and when someone stands up and protests we bomb them. You can bomb the world to pieces but you can't bomb it into peace. We have to have the courage. We have to have the moral fiber. We have to have the compassion, the sense of mercy, to say there's enough resources for everyone in this world to be adequately fed. There are enough resources for people who are suffering in a place like Bangladesh. We see people suffering in Houston. 
And we're, we're motivated to provide relief, and we should. They're our neighbors. But we don't consider the fact that at the very same time, floods in Bangladesh have inundated one-third of the country. Just imagine all of the United States east of the Mississippi River underwater. One-third of the country underwater. The whole agrarian system washed away in floodwaters. Who's going to provide relief? We have to be the people who think of relief. We have to be the people that have a global scope. The financial markets are global. The capital markets are global. The resource networks are global. Why isn't our thinking global? Why is our thinking narrow and local? We have to have the vision, and that vision has to be fueled by mercy. That vision has to be fueled by compassion. That vision has to be fueled by a sense of responsibility to those who are less fortunate than ourselves. Even in our misfortune, we're blessed. Even in our misfortune, we're blessed. People in Houston, people are sending water. They have fresh water. You haven't read of too many people who are dying of thirst in a place like Beaumont, Florida, or Beaumont, Texas, rather, where the whole water system was knocked out. There was water in there. No one's, those people in Bangladesh aren't going to have access to clean water. There's food available. People sending truckloads of food. Those people in Bangladesh aren't going to have truck, uh, access to food. Those Muslims, Rohingya Muslims, fleeing from the oppressive genocidal campaign in Myanmar or Burma. They're not going to have necessarily access to fresh water or food anytime soon. We have to have the compassion and especially the young people combine the courage of Abraham and the moral substance of Abraham to begin working and dedicating their lives to putting the institutional and structural mechanisms in place to see that people all over this world can have a chance at a dignified living. Starting with our own country. But looking beyond the shores of our country. May Allah ta'ala give us a tawfiq. May Allah bless us with strong morals and strong character. May Allah ta'ala bless us and inspire us to build as one of the poets said about that courageous young person, A courageous young person isn't one who says, my forefathers did this and that. A lot of us like to say, oh, the Muslims, we did this and we did that and we built the Taj Mahal and the Hamra Palace and we built this and the, this and that, and we had this great civilization and this great empire that stretched from Spain to the wall of China. MashaAllah, that sounds very good. What are we doing now? What are we building now? What are we contributing now? What are we doing now? A courageous young person is one who stands up and says, here I am. We have to have that courage to say, here I am, ha ana that. here I am. I'm not perfect, I have my flaws, but I'm willing to stand up and take responsibility. Despite my flaws, in spite of my shortcomings. Because if I don't, who will? If I don't, who will? Shakirani and umi. So in conclusion, just to be appreciative. A lot of us, we're not appreciative. Because we do the opposite of what our great spiritual masters have instructed us to do. They instructed us to look up to those above us in religion and look down to those beneath us in the world. In other words, look up to those who are better than us in religion. So we can be inspired. I want to memorize the Qur'an. 
I want to study the, the prophetic biography more. I want to have the ability to benefit from the Quran like that brother or that sister. I want to learn the Arabic language. I want to have the character, the patience, and the, the refined qualities that I observe in this brother or this sister. So it's inspiring us to do more. And look down on those beneath us in the world who have less of than us. Why? Because we're appreciative. As we said, if you're in Houston and your house has just been destroyed up to the four foot level, above four feet, it's salvageable. You still, and you're blessed to have insurance, not everyone is, and you have water, and you have food, you have a shelter to go to, despite the hardships, despite the difficulties of that situation, we're not trying to minimize the hardships, the difficulties involved in that situation, but if you look down on those, at those people in Bangladesh who don't have a shelter, who don't have food, who don't have potable water, or those people in India or Nepal who, whose landscapes have been ravaged by floods, then you say what? You say, Alhamdulillah, praise the Lord. I'm doing good. Even some of you might have seen the, the guy in St. Martin that her, Hurricane Irma stripped, defoliated. You look at the satellite image of all these uh, islands before and after, green before, brown now. Completely defoliated, completely wrecked. They're interviewing the man, the man, smiling and laughing. How can you laugh? Well, he was a Muslim and said, how can you laugh? But he was really cheerful. And the reporter's like, how can you be cheerful? He said, I still have my life. I have my life. So he's appreciative. Shakir on the Umi. Ibnu ala Dawud al-Shukr. Ibnu ala Dawud al-Shukr. وَقَلِيلٌ مِّنْ عِبَادِيَ الشَّكُورِ Oh, family of Da'u, embody in your actions thankfulness. Thankfulness goes beyond the tongue. We should be an embodiment of shukr. Despite the situation, the Islamophobia, or the this, or the that, or the other, we have our deen. We have our lives. We have food. We have potable water. We have shelter. We have family. We have friends, we have community. We should be an embodiment of shukr. وَقَلِيلٌ مِنْ عِبَادِيَ الشَّكُورِ And very few of my servants are truly thankful. You know why? Because they look up to those in dunya. Oh, I don't have a Lexus, I don't have a Tesla. Well, you have a Mercedes, you should be happy. You have a Lexus, but I want an electric car that doesn't make noise when it pulls up. <laughs> no, look at the man who doesn't have a car. So you can thank Allah you even have a car, no matter what brand it is. It runs. Alhamdulillah. It gets you from point A to point B. Alhamdulillah. But too many of us who are inundated, who are, who are Allah's talents, blessings flow over us. We're not appreciative because we're looking up to those above us in dunya. And I don't have, I, my house is only 10,000 square feet. They have a mansion. That means over 20,000 square feet. I should have a mansion. I work harder than they work. You should downsize from your 10,000 square feet. <coughs> you know what shakur is? Ibn al-Shukur, Ibn al-Shakur, and Ibn al-Shakur is a camel that gets fat on very little grass. That's an ideal camel. As opposed to a camel who eats, eats all the grass, nothing left for the other camel, and he's still skinny. But the Shakur is the camel, he eats a little and gets fat real easy and nice and plump. That's Shakur. In other words, a person who's appreciative for the smallest blessing. They're overwhelmingly appreciative for the smallest, smallest blessing. 
You know those people, right? You loan them five dollars. Just have the lock here. But you need a hundred. I only have five. Yeah, but subhanAllah, you know, this five is going to be like seed money. It's going to have the barakah. I'll get the other 95 so easy. That's Shakur. You gave him a little bit, overwhelmingly appreciative. Then you know the other person, right? You give them a hundred. They, they say, well, you could give me a thousand. Man, just a hundred? That's all you asked for. I know, but you, man, you're sitting on millions, man. Come on, I, you know. You can do a thousand. You only needed a hundred. I know that's before I ran into you. <laughs> no sugar. But the other five dollars out of this hundred. Oh, mashallah, alhamdulillah. You like amazed. Like you still got ninety-five to go. Yeah, that'll be easy now because the barakah is in the first of the, the gift and. MashaAllah, Allah says if you're thankful, He gives you more. Well, then, shakartum I'll just thank Allah tonight when I go to bed. That's shakur. shakur. Very few of my servants are truly thankful. We should be overwhelming. We should be beaming with thankfulness. We should be joyous people. People moping around. We should be joyous people. Say in the grace of Allah and in His mercy and this let them rejoice. It is better than anything they can gather from this world. So you don't have anything from the world, but your life, in your life you're a recipient of the grace and mercy of Allah Ta'ala, of Almighty God, you have everything. You should be joyous. And thankful. Walhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen wa sallallahu ala Sayyidi Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam tasleem al kathira akulu qawli hada wa astaghfirullah li wa lakum wa li sa'ilu mu'minin ya qawm astaghfirullah so brothers and sisters rejoice be thankful be courageous be Abrahamic have that youthful courage. And if you're not young in age, be young at heart. So everyone's eligible. May Allah bless us. May Allah bless our community. May Allah bless all the other people who relate to Abraham as their patriarch, other faiths. May Allah bless us to come together to shine the light of good on this world. May Allah bless us to come together to realize like Abraham, peace be upon him, that we have a mission. We have a mission, and it's a good mission. It's a mission of caring and sharing. It's a mission of guidance and direction. It's a mission of challenging those persistent idols that continue to erode and undermine our future viability, not just as a people, as a species. May Allah give us tawfiq. Allah mawfiq al muslimin wa muslimat wa al-mu'minin wa al-mu'minat al-ahya'i minhum wa al-amwat Rabbana la tuzid kurubana ba'di it hadaytana wa hablana billaduka rahman nikaman inna kalit al-wahab Rabbana fir'amin al-sabra wa thakil aqdamana wa msurna ala al-qawm al-kafirin Rabbana fir'amin al-sabra wa thakil aqdamana wa tawakkana muslimi wa afu anna wa fi'lana wa arhamna anta bi'udana fa msurna على الحب الكافرين اللهم إنا نعوذ بك من الهم والحزن ونعوذ بك من العجز والكسل ونعوذ بك من الجن والبخل ونعوذ بك من عالم الدين وكفر الرجال اللهم اقسم لنا من خشيتك ما تعوذ به بيننا وبين معاصيك 
ومن طاعتك ما تبلغنا بها جنتك ومن اليقين ما يهون علينا مصائب الدنيا ومتعنا بأسماعنا وأبصارنا وقوتنا ما أحييتنا واجعل الوارث منا واجعل ثأرا على من ظالمنا وانصرنا على من عدانا ولا تجعل مصعبتنا في ديننا ولا تجعل الدنيا أكبر همنا ولا مبلغ همنا ولا تسلط سلط علينا بذنوبنا من لا يخافك ولا يرحمنا يا أرحم الراحمين وعف عنا وفي لنا وارحمنا اللهم صل وسلم بارك على سيدنا وحبيبنا وقرة أعيننا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم يا أيها الذين اتقوا الله وكونوا مع الصادقين يا أيها الذين آمنوا إن الله يأمر بالعدل والإحسان وإيتاء ذي القربى وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر والبغي يعظكم لعلكم تذكرون وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم أكمل الصلاة يرحمكم الله